Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ryan Friedman, as introduced, and I have the, it's really exciting to talk to you today about some of the really cool work that Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary has been doing um, on this really neat fish called the giant sea bass. So here's a picture of one on, on this opening slide. Um, but one of the things that we're going to kind of do an interactive talk today. So I'm going to give people a couple seconds to grab some things um, if you have them around. If not, they aren't necessary to learn something fun during this talk, but it'd be helpful if people could grab either a pencil, pen, and a sheet of paper, and we'll have some cool interactions to learn about how we study this giant sea bass through at the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. So I'm just gonna give folks just one or two seconds to grab something around before I keep going. Um, I saw that we have people attending from all over, which is wonderful. And I'm really excited to talk to people in some really far flung, pla far -flung places like Russia and Nigeria, I saw on the list. And of course, hi to all those California folks that are tuning in. I saw that giant bubble. It's cool to see some support from the state right at home. Um, so I, I'm hoping folks have all the things that they need and I'm going to slowly start going on, but don't worry. Um, it's, you'll be able to catch up pretty easily. So the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, you can see here in front of you is this, um, really neat spot in Southern California. So just to, to the North of the sanctuary outline, which you can see is that dark blue area is Santa Barbara, which is where our office is located off to the East, uh, just off the image frame would be where Los Angeles is. So most people that maybe won't know where Santa Barbara is, we're very close to LA as well. And we protect these five islands that are surrounded in, by the dark blues. That's San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, Anacapa, and Santa Barbara Island all the way at the south. What's really cool about the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary is we're at this kind of thermal inter interchange. So at San Miguel and Santa Rosa, we actually have a lot of cool water species that you would typically find off of San Francisco or Monterey. And then to the east, where we have Anacapa and Santa Cruz and Santa Barbara, we would see species that are more typical of warmer waters kind of coming from San Diego and Baja. So this really cool mix is the reason why the sanctuary was protected in the first place, but it means you can see a bunch of animals in one spot, which is really neat and unique. So we protect here at the sanctuary, the animals, the habitat, the seafloor, and the water itself. In short, we as scientists here at the sanctuary have to sort of think about everything. Um, we, and we have iconic habitats like the kelp forest, which is where this giant sea bass is, as well as soft sediment and deep sea coral. So hopefully some of you are tuning in to the Ocean Exploration Trust's website these days because they're doing a bunch of deep water coral dives here at the sanctuary. Um, and so it's really interesting because we think about everything we need to protect and also about all the activities that would potentially impact a species like giant sea bass. So there's pollution. We know that scuba divers consistently interact with these giant sea bass. We know that historically fishing was a really large issue for them. They were actually overfished in California um, in the 1920s. Um, and then there's noise pollution, which can hurt a fish's ears. We've seen in other species up north that really loud sounds can actually damage their ear bones. There's also other things that could potentially impact habitat. So like accidents where the shipwrecks or boaters um, creating too much noise with engines. Um, and so, and we even research itself could potentially impact a species. So when we think about all the impacts uh, we could have on an iconic or large species like sea bass, there's a bunch of different pressures the sanctuary has to balance in terms of protecting it. So we have a lot of really cool animals at the Channel Islands. I know that I saw on the Slido deck, there was people that are interested in sharks and whales and dolphins, and we have all of those really cool things, but one of my favorites has to be the giant sea bass. So I'm gonna play you kind of a little intro um, of the giants kind of from a dive that we did a few years ago. Oh, remember it auto mutes. Go ahead and unmute because when you start a video, it puts you in mute. Sorry. Um, so you can see the current's really strong here with the kelp is pretty much laying down the currents. So the diver is there kind of hunkered down the rock and you can see the giant sea bass swimming into the frame. So just to give you an idea, Julie Bursek, who's diving here is 
uh, almost six feet tall, I believe. And so these fish are pretty significantly big. And they are they kind of are the top predator of the kelp forest. So you can see they're kind of cruising around, slowly checking divers out. They're known by divers to be extremely friendly. Some call them like the dogs of the sea and can come up and there's been instances where divers can like give them a little scratch on the head. Um, they really don't have any fear when they come up to the size, so they're really neat to dive with underwater. And they're really interesting and curious about what you're doing down there. Um, but you can see this is sort of what their home looks like. They, they like the kelp forest, they like rocky reef bottom. Um, but as I said, we don't really know much about the species. And part of the reason is they were overfished. So there's not any good habitat information as to what kind of habitats they like, when and where, and how they use them and what aspects of habitat are important. So I'm just gonna kind of let you watch them kind of swim away. You can see a couple of the other fish species that we have here in Southern California in the frame. Um, but yeah, they're, they're just a really neat fish. And we're gonna talk about a couple of different ways that we are working here at the sanctuary to protect them, which we're doing in, in a couple of different ways. You can see that one got a little spooked. All right, we're gonna go back to my, um, yeah, they're neat to see underwater. Go back to my talk. So, um, so welcome to the world of giants. So the, this is a really special fish. So as I said, back in the 1920s, they were overfished, which basically is a really fancy way of saying we took too many of them from the ocean. So up until a few years ago, this fish was really rare. People never really saw them diving. It was very rare to catch them. It was kind of a really special thing to see. Um, but now as the population comes back, we're starting to see them in all these really cool places. And a lot of researchers, both myself, researchers at UCSB, at Cal State Northridge, at Cal State Long Beach, have all started working on Oh, and, and Scripps have all started working on trying to understand this fish together in a big collective research group. So why study giants? Um, as we want to know and protect this species, it's really important to know what the best way to do that is um, as the species is recovering. And it's an important predator in the kelp forest ecosystem. So as I said, it's the top carnivore for a lot of these kelp forest systems. but we haven't really had them effectively working. And when we have a really good ecosystem and all the trophic levels are maintained, it's a good way to stabilize uh, the community to other impacts. So keeping the top predators there has some really good downward effects and keeps the ecology stable. So in order to make sure that the species is coming back, continues to come back as well as is doing is performing its role in the ecosystem. We need to understand what threats this animal could face and how it behaves to protect it better. So they're known as giants for a reason. So I'm roughly six foot tall, but these these fish have been known to get almost up to seven feet, as we guess from research on the bones and some historic photos. So you can see back, as I said, back in the 1920s, they were caught. Um, and you can see here is a bunch of giant sea bass next to some anglers that kept them as prizes. So you can see um, this is kind of off Southern California and Catalina at the time, but these fish are huge, especially compared to the anglers. Um, that is not gonna be an easy fish to pick up and keep. Um, but because they were so big and so cool to catch, we, we ended up taking a little too many. So what do we need to know about these fish? We need to know what habitats do they really like? How do um, we track the recovery of this species, which basically means how do we look at how many there are in the wild year to year, and how do we make sure that continues to go up until the species is safe or um, we feel comfortable with how many there are? And then what other threats does this species face, which we're still trying to figure out because they're relatively new in this ecosystem. So where do they go is a very basic question. We ask this with a lot of resources we protect if it's white sharks or octopuses or giants or sheephead or even lobster. Um, it's important to know where animals go. So what habitats they like, where do they travel in between, what are the important corridors to movement? So what are the highways that animals pretty much use to get from habitat to habitat? But 
on land, we have GPS and GPS doesn't work on the water. You can't exactly put your TomTom -tom or give them a cell phone and track them. So we have to think about other technologies as to how to record fish movements and understand how that works. So we do this using acoustic telemetry. So this tag here, that's actually my hand. So you're talking about a tag that's maybe two inches long. Um, these tags make a sound and that sound um, gets recorded by the acoustic receiver, which is on the right. And it's actually multiple sounds and the spaces in between the sounds leads to this tag ID. So you can see here on, on the left on the acoustic tag, this tag would be is 9716 which basically means that there's a sound nine seconds, or in this case, nine milliseconds, it's very fast. Um, and then there's another sound, seven milliseconds, another sound, one millisecond, another sound, and six milliseconds, and another sound. So that's how this works. So we're gonna kind of do a little game here. I have a five sound train. We're gonna, I'm gonna put some spaces into it. Then I'm hoping you guys can count the time in between those sounds and give me what the ID would be. So I'm gonna get everyone ready, get your listening ears on, and we're gonna start. And I'm gonna, we're gonna go in three, two, one. Ready? All right. Let's see what some people thought. Is there do we, you can write your answer in the questions box here on the GoToWebinar panel. So what do we think that sound, that ID would be? Let's see if we can get some answers from folks. All right. Go ahead and we've got a 3372, a 32, a 43462. Four, three, two, six, four. That one's, I think, the closest so far. Oh my! Um, four, three, four, six, two. That's three, right. Two, six, four. four, three, four, six, two. Yes. Yeah, okay. So I apologize if there there is some gaps, but that is what I counted out for myself. So, congratulations to whoever guessed that right. Awesome job listening, but. Um, you can tell that technology can sometimes get a little garbled, especially underwater where sound travels much farther. We can sometimes get these false detections. So we as scientists have to use a couple different filtering techniques to understand when those detections are correct. So don't feel bad because even the machines sometimes get it wrong. Um, so as the fish kind of moves through, untagged fish, won't make a sound on on the receiver so that's another important thing to mention but you can see um when the sounds come off the um off the fish it'll record the id and the time and date that the fish kind of moves through the receiver so that way if we set up a bunch of them we can kind of follow as it moves through these checkpoint stations around the islands so this is a map of where we have um, West Coast observation sites around the Northern Islands and the mainland. So we keep a set of them kind of all throughout the sanctuary, but then we also have um, a station just specifically at Santa Barbara Island. So I'm gonna go back, you can see Santa Barbara Islands down all the way in the lower right corner. Um, and I didn't put all the receiver stations on this map because it would look too tight, but this is what it looks like um, at the island. So the the different colors you're seeing behind the purple points, which is purple points are where the receivers are and the different colors below them are habitat. So the beige and kind of dark magenta colors are rock habitat. Um, and then that light sand color is sand, um, as long as the green is like a looser sand cobble mix. So you can see we put them in a lot of the reef areas where we think they like, as well as like ringing the island as a whole to understand if they're using those kind of between areas at all. Hey, so, Ryan, yes. just, um, can, there's a quick question here that relates to these, um, the ID pings. Can the fish themselves hear the ID pings? No, so we, we make sure that the sounds are at a very high frequency. It's 69 kilohertz, which is higher than what we can hear, higher than what the fish can hear, 
and higher than what marine mammals can hear. And that's important because the sea lions like to bother them. They like to tease them. So they'll nip at their fins and stuff. So we want to make sure we don't um, put like a little thing that the sea lions can basically follow around and keep bothering them. But that's a really good question. Um, oh, we make sure that all the sounds um, for all fish tags are out of the hearing range of the animal that they're on. We don't want to drive them a little crazy. Um, so I'm going to play, this is a video that I'm about to show you is the, of, I'm sorry, this is the detections by location. And then I'm also going to show you a video of the same image with the detections through time. Here you can see the fish really like that upper uh, east corner as well as the northern part of the MPA. And so that MPA, that hashed line at the bottom left corner is a protected area where there's no fishing can occur. And that's being managed by the state of California. So we know that they really like that top MPA habitat. And then they also like this upper corner, which we would call the mound, which is this interesting feature where there's this, this big bubble of rock that almost comes up out of nowhere. And so they like kind of like swimming around this like little underwater rock island um, a lot. Um, so now I'm going to play you the video. We're going to watch sort of, you can see all the sites have been drained of the color. The dots, as you can see on the left side, is going to show you the number of detections. So brown would be a small little bit of detections. And as the circle grows and as the circle gets more colorful, um, the, that'll detect, mean more detection. So we're going to start, you can see the date in the upper right hand corner is 2018. And you're going to see through time what happened. Let me just queue up the video right now. Um, uh, actually, I don't think it's on here. Um, it's possible that that got uploaded if you want to look for the drop down menu. Yeah, I'm looking at, I don't see it in the drop down, but I'll see if I can okay. play it on the main screen. I apologize if it starts skipping. Um, Hopefully you guys can see like a little bit, it'll come through. I can see it's moving a little slowly in the window, but you can basically see through time in the winter months, we don't really see a whole bunch of activity. So you can see this is January now. Um, and then as we start to pick up into the spring, um, we're gonna see a lot more activity. And then especially when we get into the heat of summer, we're gonna see a lot more activity on the array. So, that kind of get, goes to show you that they, in the summer, they're really active. They're moving around the ray. They're really using the island. And then when they get to the winter, they we think that they move deeper and out of the hearing range of the receivers. Um, and so we think that they like to use these near shore areas and these rocky reefs in the summer and when it's warm. And there's a few different potential reasons, e either food or potentially mating. Um, and then they kind of go to deeper or other habitats in the winter because we don't really detect them as much. Um, we can also look at um, the detections by hour. So you can see on the bottom that zero, zero in the lower left corner is midnight. And then you can see we're going through like a whole day. So you can see in the mornings around like 4 a.m. to about noon, the, there's some detections on the array, but it's not really um, as busy as you would think. So sometime around noon, we see this kind of uptick in activity all the way into the nighttime. These guys are really moving around the array at night um, as compared to during in the mornings, that it's gonna be a little bit more quiet for them. And we don't know if that means they're going deeper or if that just means they're going offshore into big open water, but we guess that they're probably going deeper into deeper habitats where the array is not. So, Ryan, how many have, fish have you guys tagged so far? We have tagged now with this last um, bit. I think we're up to 14 now. Um, the tags are quite expensive. They're like 700 bucks. So it's uh, not cheap. And then the receivers themselves are about two grand. So we, I think we have 14 tagged at the moment and then um, some ability to tag some more. Um, Thank you. Is there any other questions? I guess it's, it's a good yeah, place. I, was, I should have checked with you in advance if I should yeah. interject to your presentation with these questions, but they're just so timely. I thought, oh, he paused. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's another, yeah, one additional question here. Do you think that they move south in the winter? I mean, you just commented that it's possible they move offshore or deeper, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, it, we don't really know. I, I, I don't think when we, 
there are some species that make these really cool southward migrations with the temperature when we think about white sharks. I don't think that that's necessarily happening for this fish, but we do know that they can make pretty long migrations. So I don't think it's totally out of the question, but we haven't seen any evidence of that yet. But we do have fish that were tagged at Canalina making their way all the way to Anacapa and doing so in under two days. So these guys can move pretty long distances at a pretty high rate. Wow. And then of those 14 that you tagged, do you know how many of them are male versus female? Are you able to tell that? It's really hard to tell from the outside. Um, there is some thoughts that there might be slight differences, but it's hard to tell if they're male or female um, based on the outside. So I don't have a good, um, I don't have a good gender ratio for them. Got it. Well, there's a whole slew of questions that are coming in now. I'm gonna let you continue your presentation and I'll flag the ones that we come, we come back to. Thanks. Great, I, there'll be plenty more time for questions as they come along, but feel free to just give me a good one if we're like in the point. Um, so one of the really cool things about giants and why we got into them is we think giants are pretty talkative fish. We know that they can, we think that they use their ribs to beat on their organs and they make this boom sound. So when you hear it underwater, it almost sounds like a small little firework went off underwater far away. And that's super interesting. Um, lots of animals use sound um, to uh, communicate lots of different things, be that breeding, be that um, stay away from my spot. And we don't really know how giants use that, but they, I'm gonna play a, another little game with you where we're gonna go through some five sounds that other animals are using, and I want you to guess what kind of animal they are. So we're gonna do five sounds. I will play them one by one. I'll play them twice so you guys can get a chance to listen. And I want you guys to write down your answers of what you think they are. All right, here's the first one. <laughs> So you can also type this in to Yeah, you can also type it in. This this should be an easier one for people that have done a lot of the the webinars before. All right, I'm gonna move on to two and we'll come back and I'll play any of the others that you want to listen to. All right, what do you guys think two is? Put it in the box and write it down. All right, who's ready for number three? All right, number three. I'll give you a hint, this is your only not underwater one. <laughs> All right, gonna do number four. All right, that one's short. I'll give you one more time at it. All right, and then five, last one. All right, if, if we need to hear any others one more time, can we put it in the um, chat box and I, I'll play them. Okay, yeah, we've got lots of good guesses here. No one's suggesting to replay anything quite yet. Okay. Maybe after we get the real results, they might want to hear it again. Perfect, yeah. So did we get any good guesses for number one, Claire? 
We got lots of whale, some humpback whale to be specific. Well, those uh, people. Uh, those people got it right. Number one is humpback whale, which is a pretty common one we have out here at the Channel Islands um, and up and down the West Coast. They're really neat and large, but they're known for that song that you heard. Do we have any good guesses for two? Yeah, for two, we have, um, well, I mean, I honestly don't even know what the sound is. We have sea lion, Pacific, white-sided dolphin, um, orca, bottlenose dolphin. Yeah, there's a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch. Well, whoever got orca got it right. It's a very strange sound that you would think not come from an animal that big, but that is indeed number two was an orca whale. Can we hear that uh, one again? <laughs> yeah, I can say it again. Yeah, this is what an orca whale sounds like. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it kind of sounds like traffic to me. Um, any good guesses for number three? Three, we got a lot of bird, parrot, some kind of bird, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, this is a lyre bird, which is from Australia. They're also known as mimic birds, and they can make a bunch of strange sounds, and they have a really neat range of sounds that they can make. But I'm glad we got a lot of bird folks. How about number four? This is one that you can kind of see from the shore here in California a bunch. I hear it all the time. Yeah, seal, sea lion. It's kind of yeah, the number, majority of the guesses. Number four is a California sea lion, which if you live here in California, I saw a bunch of you do, you probably run into this guy at least once or twice, especially um, near if you're near harbors or on the on the shoreline. And then last one is my tricky one. It's number five. What do we got guesses? Okay, we've got boat, ship, giant sea bass. That's okay. kind of the gist of number five. Well, it's not a boat or a ship, even though it sounds like, but that is indeed a fish. That is a plain fin bin chicken. Um, which is a really interesting sound to come from a little tiny fish, but they make that noise. They are some records of them here in Santa Barb, um, in a, in the Channel Island Sanctuary. But we don't have a really good recording of sea bass yet underwater. Um, there's been a couple of research uh, being done. There's a couple of records of them from GoPro footage and camera footage of the booms that they make as well as a, a new paper that just came out very recently describing the sounds that um, they were recorded in a tank. Um, but we we know that they probably can make noise, but it's been pretty understudied of what those noises are and um, what they use them for. So we're not quite sure what the booms and different rolling sounds that they can make are for. It's potentially we communicate with each other or defend territory from other species. And that might be why they're booming at divers underwater. But we're really interested in trying to figure out why and what role that could play in their life history. Um, and we do this by putting out sound traps. So th this device you can see on the right side, this silver canister is the actual sound trap. And the top is a hydrophone, which is basically an underwater microphone. And we record just ambient sounds in the water um, alongside this kind of uh, acoustic telemetry array. So hopefully in the next round, we'll have um, times where the fish kind of comes through and we know that they're in the area and co-occurring sound for them to be recorded on. So we can try and get some idea of the sounds that they're making underwater. So Ryan, there's been several requests before you get too far down your slides to play the uh, mid that fish again, number five. Oh, you want to play the midshipman? Yeah. yeah. Back real they just quick. are just dumbfounded by this. Yeah. yeah, it does not sound anything like you would expect. Uh, it's like the steady hum of a container ship or something. Yeah, it sounds like a boat engine, totally. Oh, there you have it, number five. Yeah, number Thank five. Thank you for doing that. No problem. And you, it, this is what they look like. They're weird looking, like little swampy looking fish. Um, but you can see um, this is how the sound traps go in. And quite frequently as we're working the field, 
many marine biologists know this very well. Things get dirty, things like to grow on them, and this is what they look like when they come out. And I have many poor people that I work with that have been subjected to helping me clean them, which is a rather smelly task. But uh, that's only three months of growth. So you can imagine um, how dirty they can get after six months or a year. Um, so we actually have sound traps all over the sanctuary to listen for different things, including the whales and the and the ship traffic noise that we come that are, comes through on the northern side. And we hope to record all kinds of sounds from having these sound traps out and listening, um, both the kinds of human uses that we get in the sanctuary, the weird sounds like plain fin, mid, uh, plain fin midshipmen, and also whales and dolphins and all those other animal sounds that we think make a really cool sanctuary, as well as like just ambient noise. So storms or rains or swell events, um, we also wanna start to get acoustic signatures to understand how noisy our sanctuary is. So, and then there's one more neat way we study giants um, and that's with their spots. So we partnered with um, UCSB and researchers um, at Cal State Northridge and we know that giant spots are unique like our fingerprints. And so we can use them to figure out who's who. And we've done this with a couple different animals before. So zebra stripes are unique. Uh, whale sharks and their spots are unique. The underbellies of mantas have distinct color patterns. And we can use all those identifying markers um, to watch a fish through its lifetime. So you can see the baby giant sea bass is up in the left. And that orange fish is actually the what they look like when they're really little before they grow into this big kind of gray, dark, larger animal. But the spots are pretty much consistent as they grow. Um, so we can use them to track through time, both from divers that are going out for fun and take their pictures and post them on the internet or um, of pictures we use ourselves. So we can use drop cameras or our divers can take pictures and we feed them into a database to track them through time. Um, so this is uh, our last little fun activity altogether. Um, I want you to pull out your paper and pencil and I want you to close your eyes, and then I want you to make five random dots on that piece of paper. And then I want you to measure the distance from that the middle dot or the closest middle dot uh, to all the others with your thumbs and sum up the total. And then hopefully you can put some of those numbers in the box and we'll see all the different numbers you guys can make by just kind of this random chance. I'm gonna give people a few seconds to do that and Claire, let me know when some of those numbers start rolling in together. All right, you got that. Here, I was busy doing the activity myself. I gotta focus on the webinar here. <laughs> yeah. While we're waiting, I'll take, oh, is there another really good question while we're waiting for people to kind of get their numbers in? Sure. Um, are you tracking giant sea bass around Catalina Island? Uh, I am not, but the Cal State Long Beach folks have an array and did a big extensive tracking project around Catalina. And then there's another group that's tracking them off La Jolla in San Diego. So these three movement studies are all sort of working together to understand where they are. And the tags are compatible. So if my fish goes to Catalina and their ray picks it up, they would let me know. Excellent. Another question while we're waiting for people, how long do the batteries in the tags last? So though it depends on the size, but the tags we're using on the giants are pretty much good for three years. Okay. All right, looks like um, a lot of responses are coming in. So we'll go back to the activity. Someone's got a two, an 18, a 3.5, several of 3.5, seven total, four, 6.25, 1.5 thumbs, 3.76, 875, three yeah. thumbs total, eight, four, you guys are really exact. I like these like 0.5s and 0.7s. My last group that I did this with, they they didn't get so exact. So kudos and bonus points to my very precise friends out there. Um, so we kind of just do exactly what you did, um, but just in a program. So we actually take, when we get these images of these sea bats, we put dots in the direct center of where the spots are. And then we just measure the distance between that spot and all surrounding spots. And we keep a log of those distances. So then when we get a new photo, we if we get a matchup of those center points, we know it's the same fish. Where this gets a little tricky is the left side and the right side get different are different. So 
if would there's ever video where we see both sides, then we know where we can have like one individual. Otherwise, we match it by side if we can't get confirmed footage of both the left and right side. And then we just track as photos come through through time. So you, if you go diving in California or snorkeling and you see one of these guys and you get a good photo, can submit your photos to this project. It's the Spotting Giant Sea Bass Project. I have the um, I have the URL in the slide, and when it, this is posted, you can go back and get it. Um, so please help. If you see these guys and you're diving or you're getting around, um, please send us photos. It's really great, and it's uh, we will get back to you and we'll follow up with where your fish was seen before and after. Um, and we also use the internet, so we can call through social media or Google and pull those thing, pull those photos as long as there's uh, geotag information to it. And then we also do these beta drop cams where we put GoPros on this like big kind of contraption with a piece of bait that brings in um, the fish so we can get good photos of them. So my last two videos I'm gonna play for you are from these drop cameras and I'm gonna let them kind of play in total for you. And then we will do um, any kind of questions and final stuff at the end. So it's gonna mute me and we're gonna go. So you can see the bait's bringing them in and then they just kind of swim past. So we would just grab like a string grab of that and then measure out the dots. Then I have one more that we'll play. So you can see that that one was pretty interested in the bait. Um, he just wanted to get it out of that bag that we have. Um, so with that, um, I have to acknowledge that this work is truly a team effort. Um, the Sync Sound folks that have put out the sound traps, that's in partnership with the Naval Postgraduate School, with the Navy, with NOAA Fisheries, with Scripps um, Institute of Oceanography, and um, NOAA's uh, Office of Natural Moon Sanctuaries headquarters, and all of the wonderful folks across the system, because they have put sound traps nationwide, um, and without them, this work would not be happening. Um, then also staff from Cardinal Point Captains and Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary for their support in getting us to Santa Barbara Island, helping us do all the dives. And then of course, the Spotting Giant Sea Bass Project and the Giant Sea Bass Research Collective, which includes UCSB, the Love Lab, CSU, um, Northridge, the Benioff Ocean Initiative, and Cal State Long Beach. Um, so with that, I think that's the last slide I had. So any questions you guys might have, I think is it's a great time for that now. Okay. Lots